giving you background. Where have I come from? Um, and we'll go from there to areas like um, uh, illness and its healing, both um, explained and unexplained, because of course I did a medical course. And I'm sure we're going to end up in a subject which always keeps coming up. Uh, and the subject of adversity and of suffering. It just leads us there. Well, the story starts with my father, who was a bit like Wes. He was the son of a Methodist minister. Uh, he was a rebel of the manse, as was traditional in those days and probably still is. Um, he was bright though. He went to Adelaide High School and won a scholarship to PAC and then uh, to the Adelaide University where he did engineering and he was employed then by, what do they call it, the Adelaide Electric Supply Company, I think was its name, which later became nationalised into ETSA, which we all know about. And he was sent off to England as a high voltage transmission trainee uh, to come back uh, to this state and run all the substations and essentially the, el the electric power supply for Adelaide. Um, but he was a rebel of the Nats, even though he was a good engineer. And it was late in his late 20s he met a radiant Christian in Tunbridge Wells, it was, in England. And he saw the Christ that this man believed in. And he was transformed. He became a Christian by a crisis. And he always believed in that. Uh, I think I came to believe in it too. And you'll find out why. Uh, so at the age of 29, he became a Christian. But like some other people who become Christians late in life, they have a, a different look at what Christianity is. Um, my father used to have a, sa uh, a way of putting that. He'd said, uh, if you go to a Christian school, etc., you can be inoculated so that you don't actually catch the real thing. Full of inoculation. Um, and uh, there were many examples of that that we saw over the years and we believed him. He married soon after returning from England, uh, came to Belair, where we now live, and joined up with the Belair Methodist Church, a small village church there, and was soon a lay preacher, the superintendent of the Sunday school, and the leader of the Bible class. Uh, they had big Sunday schools in those days. Now, there may be some of you who remember that. A village Sunday school had hundreds of students in the Sunday school. It's obviously a long time ago. Um, but after some years of leading the Bible class and uh, uh, experiencing many of the lives of the young people whom he led, he realised something was wrong. You see, he had um, come into a personal relationship with Christ and he couldn't see that in the young people. We read the Bible stories, uh, we, we heard them, we suffered or tolerated church and Sunday school didn't appear to enjoy it to him, uh, he was concerned. So after some years, a, a minister had arrived in the circuit they used to have in those days, who had come from missionary work in Fiji. And he also realised that there was something missing. There were some fine Christian folk in the circuit, but um, many of them, and particularly most of the young people, didn't seem to think that Sunday school was anything but a muck around time and church was something you tolerated. So they had the first ever church camp for the, for the circuit. Belair, Blackwood and Eden Hill. The young people were summoned to a camp and it was at Adair, 1955, long weekend in January. Um, the leaders, there were about ten leaders who had prayed for this camp for weeks um, and there it was. Now you all know what church camps are like. We had no experience of it. Slightly rough living, slightly rough sleeping, good fun at meal times with all the chores that go with it, 
Um, early morning swims, lots of fun, Saturday night concert, an essential. I can't remember any serious studies in that camp, but I know there were a couple of important addresses. And one was on the Sunday night where they had a church service on the premises. Now, of course, those days they didn't have a church at Adair. The place itself was a, uh, a campsite or a, a meeting place. So it was inside the premises of the building. But I remember that night, the minister preached from John 20. Now, you all know it when I talk about it, but we didn't know much about it. It was about Thomas. Um, and of course, Thomas was the one that wouldn't believe when the other disciples said, we've seen the Lord, he's risen. And uh, you remember the, the threat he made, unless I put my hands into the print of the nails and put my hand in his side, I won't believe. Um, Jesus had said, peace be to them, and of course he had showed them his wounds. And it was about a week later, All that happened uh, on the first resurrection Sunday. But a week later they were all together again. They were behind locked doors. Everyone was afraid of the Jews. It had been a time of great unrest. Their leader had been arrested, charged and put through a a false trial and then the horror of a a Roman crucifixion, uh, which is a scandal to Jews, of course. Cursed be he who hangs on a tree. That was something which was just horrific to them. Um, they were all together. The doors were locked and Jesus appeared again and he said again, a peace be with you. And this minister was telling us this. It was probably a quarter of an hour he preached, not very long. And he seemed to know all about what Thomas had been saying, as you know. So he turned and said, Thomas, put out your finger, touch my wounds, and put your hand in my side. And don't be faithless, but believing. Um, We heard this very simply told. And since then I have often thought, what was going on in this man? The man called Doubting Thomas. You might remember that he was the one who when Jesus said, I have to go and wake Lazarus. And they said, well, if he's sleeping, he's all right. And Thomas said, let's go with him that we may die with him. Why? Because Bethany, where Lazarus lived, was two miles from Jerusalem. And everyone was looking for Jesus. This was to be uh, the end. And I guess he thought, well, if he goes, we might as well go. Not the sort of words that a person without loyalty would actually say. Um, But instantly on this occasion, Thomas knew this man. He had been with him for three years, lived with him. He had heard the things he had said, the the astonishing claims that he had made, such as, uh, he who has seen me has seen the Father. No Jew would have called God Father. And that the things he did were astonishing. Uh, But they were, they had a special message. Um, And... Uh, Jesus had said things like, the works I'm doing are actually the Father's works in me. I wonder if they understood that. I don't know whether they could have at the time. He actually said things like, if I do not the works of my Father, don't believe me. You'd never hear a politician say anything like that. It was an incredibly humble thing to say. And then, of course, the, the promises and the astonishing claims of who he was Now that last Passover feast was different from all the other Passover feasts. I mean they commemorated this great event of course which was back in the times they were slaves in Egypt. On this occasion he had broken the bread and had said a strange word. This is my body broken for you. And then after supper the cup. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do you think they could have understood what he was talking about. Well, he was gone. He had gone. And you can imagine what sort of weekend the disciples had. They'd all fled, as Jesus had told them they would. I will strike the shepherd, he quoted, and the sheep will be scattered. I reckon Peter would have had a rotten weekend. But suddenly, here he is. 
And Thomas didn't carry out his threat, as you know. He knew this man now like he had never known him before. He knew who he was. Oh yeah, he was Jesus of Nazareth, no doubt about that. He didn't need to touch the wounds to know that. He knew also that he was Lord over death um, and all of his enemies. That he was truly the Messiah as his works had pointed to, as the prophets had all foretold. More than that, because you see, they had never connected their Messiah with being God. And there breaks out of Thomas that claim, that profession, which is the pinnacle of John's Gospel. My Lord and my God. And that's essentially the end of what John is saying. There's a bit of a postlude after that. Thomas believed with all his heart and soul. And um, the minister preached this. It was very simple. But then he impersonalised it. He said, it's not enough for you young people in this circuit to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You have to know him as your Lord and your God. It was a simple, a simple time together, really. Uh, the service ended. There was no altar call. Billy Graham hadn't been to Australia. No one had ever heard of an altar call. Probably the minister had never seen it. There was a small devotional that followed and one girl indicated she wanted to receive Christ as her Lord and Saviour. And the minister said, if any of you want to speak to the leaders, you do so. That was it. There was an hour to lights out. People wandered about a dare. It was strange though. It was quiet. There seemed to be a restraining influence over the camp. There was no shy acting. There were no raised voices. People wandered around almost like they were shell-shocked. Often little groups or individuals. They were talking uh, earnestly uh, in unusual ways. I heard one young man saying, I shouldn't have done such and such and I, I'm, going to, I'm going to burn the magazines that I've been reading. You can imagine what sort of magazines they might have been. Interesting sort of, it was very different from the rest of the camp. Uh, lights out came and went. No bell rang. Uh, there was no signal that everyone had to go to bed, so people kept wandering around. The discussions continued. People were starting to go to leaders. My father and my mother, who were there in the blue room, and the minister and his wife, and there were probably a couple of others involved, and they were asking how they could become a Christian. And the leaders were praying with them, with a simple prayer of confession um, and acceptance of Christ as Lord. One of them was me. I was 15. My father led me to Christ in January 1955, 53 years ago. At midnight, my father compared notes with the minister. 26 young people had come to Christ in those three hours outside of a meeting. No group dynamics, no pleading. No one had ever heard anything like that. Pre Billy Graham, as I said. It was an astonishing thing, really. My father never got over that, and I suspect he never should have. But neither did I. And how do you explain that? Because no one could explain it. I had no experience of anything like that. Well, God's about the only explanation that people could come up with. You might remember the first verse of the Bible. I think it's in the NIV. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, out, was without form and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And my father believed that that night the Spirit of God was hovering over that camp, that he came down and... People had heard a simple gospel but, but the leaders had been praying for something and it happened and it caught them all by surprise. And when you read the Acts, that was happening all the time. The Christian church was constantly being taken by surprise when the spirit, who was the head of mission of course, uh, led them into strange things. And that led to a choir, a young people's choir, praying together, learning together 
together how to worship. Preaching bands started going out from, from that group. Um, and the enjoyment of Christian worship and Christian growth as young people was a critical time really. Two years later I enrolled at the University of Adelaide to do medicine. There I encountered the IVF movement. Some of you may have heard of InterVarsity Fellowship. It's got various names now around the country. And I learned there much about the scriptures as the reliable guide to faith and conduct. Much great and good literature in those days. Um, I uh, read the writings of a man called C.S. Lewis. I read uh, my first copies I got in 1957, about two shillings. He's been my mentor now for 51 years. Um, but IBF was very good. It taught what you would call orthodox um, the Christian faith, um, the authority of the scriptures uh, as a guide in faith and conduct. And during that time, I learned what medicine was about, the basic building blocks, anatomy, physiology, that's normal function of the body, then pathology, uh, disordered function, and then the therapeutics, it was a six-year course, pharmacy, medicine, surgery, a small smattering of psychiatry, which no one went to those lectures because, as they said, what's that got to do with medicine? Now, of course, it's a large part of a medical course, despite which Western civilization people get madder and madder. It's funny, isn't it? Uh, but I don't know much psych uh, psychology or, uh, or psychiatry. But the IBF court taught me what they said was orthodox theology and they said I was a conservative evangelical. I'm still not 100% sure what that is. But they had many great teachers and missioners, usually highly qualified, masters of arts, doctor of divinity, doctor of philosophy, etc. And I held office at one stage in the IBF movement. I thought I, l I knew the Christian landscape very well. I'd been well taught. I was even a little doubtful about those who hadn't heard what I had heard, nor were they well qualified or had a tertiary training. I was ripe for a shock. It came in 1966 when I was uh, two years graduated uh, and I was starting to train for surgery. And an interesting event occurred my father-in-law had turned up in my wife's life. Now, he'd been divorced from her mother when she was only six. And he had been a violent man, an unfaithful man. It was a bitter divorce. They tended to be in those days. The adversarial system made sure it was. If they had grown up poor as a church mouse, as they used to say, uh, there was no social security in those days. Her mother had no training. She occasionally did a part-time job, but she had to bring up two daughters. And added to that difficulty was the stigma of divorce. Not much stigma about it now. In fact, if anything, perhaps the stigma is on marriage in this strange modern civilization we live in. Our young people don't want to be married. There's something funny about that. It's sort of a trap that they've laid for me. Well, something, I'm not sure. Her mother got sick and she died uh, before Faye was 21 of cancer. And the day she left, the day Faye left that home with her mother in hospital, the house was condemned by the council. No one lived in it thereafter. But her father had become a Christian. At a Billy Sunday meeting, and I never heard Billy Sunday, but I had heard his name. He then went to Bible school. He then became a CRC pastor. He started a church in his four-car garage at Salisbury. Unlike the event, you might say. We got to know him. His belief systems were actually fairly different from mine. But he was a man of great conviction. And in 1966, he had built a, a new little church, a bigger one, and he had a mission in his little church. And the missioner surprised me. He'd got to grade six in primary school in Texas. He was yay round. He couldn't pronounce most medical words. And he was shy. He'd pray all day 
And then when he preached at night, he was powerful. It was a phenomenon I'd never seen. And he preached for conversion. And one night I saw a row of men right across the front of the church come out to receive Christ. Working Aussie blokes. There are at least two blue singlets among them. Now that is a sign of the Spirit. It's usually the shy little girls who creep forward to receive Christ. Then they go out in the mission field, you know. These were Aussie working men. Now that's a sign of something. And I saw something else. The two-week mission that he was having for his church grew into a six-week mission for many churches in Adelaide. And people were coming from as far as 200 kilometres away to this little church in Salisbury where this man preached and amazing things were happening. Um, Something new I saw. He often prayed for people's ills. And he was often quite specific about the problem, even if he couldn't pronounce it. And he would know somewhere, he would know somewhere near where the person was sitting. And he'd know what part of their body was the problem. I'd never seen that. Bruce would have seen it. Others would have seen this. He called this the gift of knowledge. And of course it gave great faith to the person who was being described when they recognised themselves. So they'd come out for prayer and many were healed. And I remember one night, He was praying about smoking, praying about smoking. Um, He said that if anyone wanted deliverance, they should come forwards. And a young man from our church, West Mitcham Methodist, came bounding down the aisle. He was engaged to a young lady in our church and he was a chain smoker with yellow fingers to prove it. Uh, But the missionary was saying it's not just an expensive habit, he said, it's a bondage. And of course now we know that's actually true. An addiction is a form of enslavement in a way. There was at that point no evidence about its production of cancer, but that was a different thing. And as he came down the aisle, both the missioner and Faye's father said, you're healed already, you can go back to your seat, we don't need to pray for you. How about that? I've never seen anything like that either. Later that night he went to our minister in West Mitcham and showed him his hands and all the nicotine stains had disappeared from his hands. He never smoked again. Astonishing. Um, Now Mervyn was the senior steward at that church, a gracious, godly man. Um, um, He was the senior steward who greeted people and he was he just made people feel so much at home. A delightful character he was. He was deaf in his right ear. And he had been to a senior ENT surgeon in Adelaide and um, was told he couldn't be helped. And deafness was a nuisance to him because he couldn't hear people uh, who were overtaking him on the right side. You might remember some of you we used to leave the driving window open in those days, usually. We didn't have air conditioners. You left the window open and you could hear what's going on as well as see in the rear vision mirror. Um, And he was in the church one night when the missionary says, you don't have to come forward to be healed. You reach out to Christ where you are and he'll heal you there. And he turned to his wife and he said, I can hear. He meant in his right ear. And he told me about this on Sunday at church. I didn't know about it at the time. I said, well, come round and I'll have a look in your ear. I had done ENT in my second year as an RMO. So I had a look in it. He could hear. That was the astonishing thing. And when I looked in his ear, he had a a reniform, a kidney-shaped defect in the middle. um, And around the outside was a thick, pale rim of thickened tissue. And that defect would have been a a hole but it was filled in by an opalescent membrane like a child's eardrum and it could hear all right. I was very curious so I rang the ENT surgeon who was a senior uh, man in town. I said I'd done ENT and I knew one of his patients, Mervyn, who was deaf in his right ear. I said I was just interested to know um, why you couldn't help him and he said well Uh, He had a a large tympanic perforation. I was going to do a graft. 
but he, he got out his audiogra- uh, audiograms and he said he had nerve deafness so I couldn't do a graft I'm afraid there was nothing I could do for him well of course he didn't have to do anything for him and even now I don't know how medical science could have done anything for the hearing in that man so I was astonished I remember telling some of my Christian doctor friends about this at a later stage and a couple of them just poo-pooed it and said ah there'll be some other explanation of this but you see it's very hard to find one so this was an astounding thing what I was seeing was the beginning of what we now know as the charismatic movement that was in a Pentecostal church but quite soon it was in many of the churches often in those who um, hadn't really had much um, formal teaching you could say and strangely enough it was often the churches who regarded themselves as very well taught and the evangelical elite that would have nothing whatsoever to do with it and from such churches came statements such as it's of the devil uh, some of you may remember that era um, you know it's a very dangerous thing ever to say you might remember that some, some rather similar comments came from the Pharisees about the ministry of Jesus. It's, a, it's dangerous to ascribe the works of the Spirit of God to the dark powers, according to Jesus. There were some excesses in those days. Uh, you might say there was some poor theological discipline about, but there was a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of joy. And many believers that came into a new understanding of the person and work of the Spirit of God in those days. Um, there was a risk that many concentrated on the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit as if this was the big special and all the rest that they'd ever known about Christianity were, was minor and introductory. Uh, that's an error. Um, Forgetting, really, that the main ministry of the Spirit is to glorify Christ. You see it at there, 55. The Spirit is the one who showed us Christ as Lord. There's certainly no doubt he was the one who brought 26 young people into the kingdom of God that night. And uh, it was quite appropriate that it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened in my father's life. But... Um, I later came to believe um, that really Pentecost, it's it's all there in the Acts, Pentecost was the event whereby the Spirit came according to the promise of Jesus and it wasn't till then that they really understood what Jesus was about and they didn't understand what he was doing in that crucifixion. He didn't understand, they hadn't understood what he had said to them. He told them three times it was going to happen. Nothing gelled. They didn't understand. So that they were shocked when it happened, which proves that they hadn't really heard. It was the coming of the Spirit whereby they understood and they saw. And they didn't need a three-year Bible course. Peter preached instantly about what this meant. Peter, foot in mouth Peter, became Peter the bold apostle, full of understanding, became the leading apostle, really, and it was all by the Spirit. Now, we, we know something about that since then. Um, and I then came to hear thorough, systematic and deep teaching of the Scriptures through multiple teachers, um, and one of the most influential was the New Creation Teaching Ministry. Some of you will have heard of that ministry, Uh, in Coromandel East, uh, whereby many, many um, ministers have had their ministry catalyzed and come to a new understanding and realized what they knew only poorly. Um, And many people have been encouraged in their Christian walk. It was probably at about the time of Baxter Kruger's first visit here that he said his reception in Adelaide was something that that was a great delight to him because he had been becoming very rocky 
in his uh, faith at that time, so he told us. And I told him I believed that um, many people had been ready to hear what he was saying. They had actually been prepared for it by being well taught and they recognised some, some of the things he was saying. It wasn't so new to them. And I learned about the Father because he, uh, well, there was very little taught about God the Father. I don't know why because Jesus talks so much about that. He uses the word Father about 122 times uh, in John's Gospel. More than any of the, than the, perhaps the rest of the New Testament put together. Certainly he talks about my Father far more than all the other Gospels put together. And of course that's really why John wrote his Gospel. That, that people might understand that close relationship. And um, in England, where I went later on following my fellowship, we had fellowship in many churches with many Christians of different uh, colours. Denominations, you know, are a human invention. We discover that eventually, don't we? High Church England, uh, people, we had wonderful fellowship. Catholic Charismatics, Lutherans, Open Brethren, Church of Christ and many others. And we went to a Baptist church there because the Baptist church was the one that was alive. And that of course happens in little country towns, doesn't it? You go to the church that's alive, who cares what the label is? There won't be any labels in heaven anyway. Uh, And I learned, of course, and I have learned, that there is no church that's got it right. And there's no structure that's perfect. And God's had to work with faulty structures all the time of human history. But we know he can bring the truth with the jawbone of an ass, and he still does. Um, Simple faith sometimes is the only thing, and it can be communicated because the Spirit is there. And that simple little man from Texas prayed all day and preached boldly because he really was led by the Spirit of God. Um, and we remember, of course, that the church is not, um, it's not really the collection of the perfect people as the world would often try and paint them and then try and uh, show why they're not because that's so easy to do. It's really a company of sinners, as Smithy reminded us of that playgroup. So it's a very good name, Company of Sinners. It sort of puts it where it is. And from there, uh, you can say, of course, saved sinners. But, so my getting of wisdom and understanding was actually pretty slow. It probably took something like 40 years. And um, that is how I discovered what God was like, principally from the revelation of Christ as Lord and that was the beginning and of course it's the most central part of everything we ever discover he was Lord over death and he was Lord of my life and um, you know we only know the Father through Christ and of course he was the one who said that the Spirit um, of God he would send him from the Father in fact he He even speaks as if um, it was to the great advantage of the disciples that he go away. Uh, I think he talks about that in John 16. Yes. Because I've said these things that he was going away, sorrow has filled your hearts, but I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. But if I do not go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, he will send him to you. And when he comes, and then he spoke about the ministry of the Spirit, and he would lead them into truth. And in those three chapters, he talks about he will, he doesn't speak on his own authority. He will declare what is to come. He'll take the things of Christ. He'll make them real to us. None of us understand the Scriptures without the Spirit who both wrote them and now interprets them to the believer today and of course it was actually true that they were going to be better off when Jesus was no longer physically present because he could indwell every believer all the time 
That's what he intended to do. And when um, Peter and John were the instrument by which Christ healed the man crippled at the gate beautiful, they spoke as if it was still Jesus doing it, because it was. By his name, by faith in him, that this man stands well before you, said Peter and John. They didn't have anything of themselves. So the work of Christ is continuing. Um, So just as Jesus had said the Father was in him and the Father was doing his works in Jesus, so by the Spirit Jesus was in the apostles and they were doing the work of Jesus by the same Spirit. And the same is therefore true, of course, for us. So it was better that they had Jesus, as it were, not geographically localised, but internalised. That was the promise, of course, that... um, that's the promise that Jeremiah made, that, that God would write his law in the hearts of the people and they would want to obey and they would be empowered to obey because until then the law had been an accuser. Paul talks about it as essential. Show us where we are to bring us to Christ. But only in Christ do we have any chance, of course, fulfilling uh, what he wants us to do. And I'm going to be taking you back to medicine and what I learned there and then some of what I have seen over 45 years of medicine. But you see, uh, John's Gospel perhaps speaks more strongly than any others of the relationship between Christ and his Father and the fact that they were only going to really understand when the Spirit came. So the Trinity shouts at you from all the pages, yet some people cannot see that. It took the church a long time to work it out. It seems strange, doesn't it? Sometimes hundreds of years to get it settled. But then we're talking about doctrine. We're talking about theology. It's a human activity. Therefore, it's imperfect. It's incomplete. Uh, it's never, uh, and, and you'll never argue anyone into the kingdom of God. It's only Christ who converts them. In fact, um, Uh, Ezekiel, of course, talked about um, conversion as replacing a stony heart with a fleshy heart. So, Christian Barnard did not do the first heart transplant. God did, and he's been doing it in huge numbers uh, ever since. But I have raised a conundrum. Now, the time's about half past, so I think we'll be breaking for a for a short break, but I've raised a conundrum for you, whether you realise it or not. Um, I've done medicine. I've been uh, practising medicine now for 45 years, stopping only this year. But I've told you of events that have no medical explanation. I think they were miracles. Um, And so the conundrum and many have faced this, and many of you will have been aware of this. What do you do with an illness? Do you pray that God will heal it, or do you go to the doctor? Um, and we'll spend more time on that uh, after the break. But I remember having phone calls from a number of Pentecostal pastors after I had been known as uh, Clary Carslake's son-in-law, I suppose. And they wanted me to come and do a home visit because they had a problem. But they couldn't be seen going to the surgeon's rooms because they would be accused of not having faith. I don't know whether you've ever come across that. Yep, yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, a great conundrum. Um, so what is the answer? Well, have a cup of coffee and I will speak more about these things but then I'll go on to the whole area of illness and where it comes from and what God is doing through these things. So we'll break for a little short break.
consciousness, <clears throat> the mystery, of course, there are a lot of mysteries in our faith. Uh, that one was, of course, no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor has it yet entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But he's given us an inkling of it by his spirit. He was quoting Isaiah. But, um, but for that we see nothing. Well, I, I spoke of a conundrum that I had raised for you. Um, there wasn't any facile explanation for a man with nerve des- deafness hearing normally. Um, so what is the place of divine healing, if you like to call it that, miracles of healing in the church? There's plenty of contention about that in many places. And I can't give you a total explanation. Um, Back in 1966, the minister called it a taste of revival. And I don't disagree with that. I think that was, it was something unusual, extraordinary. It wasn't actually in the norm of his experience, nor is it the norm in mine. Um, And I've never seen quite the things I saw there in any other situation. Um, They were as if they were signs. John describes signs associated with the powerful preaching of the gospel. They're a sign of the kingdom. And of course the kingdom is not yet fully established. It is still to fully come. Um, There were excesses associated even with that little mission. I saw persons who were asking for gold fillings to their dental caries. Now, their dental caries came from neglect and poor hygiene. They wanted gold fillings. It seemed to me... Um, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Um, seemed a bit consumerist to me, you know. Um, you remember what happened when Jesus fed the 5,000? Five loaves and two fishes. Astonishing. A mob of them turned up the next day. And remember what he said? You seek me not because you saw the sign, but you had your fill of the loaves. You want another free meal. Um, and then he tells them, don't labour for temporary gain. And after all, the meal lasts about four hours. Look for the eternal things. You know, a Messiah could have been very useful to the national economy then, couldn't it? He would would help with the budget. Um, So you see, there's that consumerist thinking that he was... Well, he was sad that they hadn't actually seen the sign. A sign points. A sign is significant. Significant. It points to a truth which they hadn't seen. While they were watching the miracle, they still hadn't seen the sign. Um... And I have treated a lot of people from a background of um, charismatic experience who used to manipulate me. I have had people who've had cancer that I was going to have to remove. And they say, there's going to be another prayer meeting tomorrow night, so can you come and examine me at 7 o'clock on the operation morning and see if it's still there? And they meant that. Uh, I thought their request was a bit difficult, but I, I remember I did it. Their God was playing peekaboo with them, you see. He might or he mightn't. Perhaps you have to hold your mouth the right way when you say the right words. Now, God's bigger than that. Um, One lady forbade me to remove a low rectal cancer the orthodox way uh, because that would have meant taking away the sphincter muscle and giving her a colostomy. She'd already seen another surgeon. He said, that's the only operation appropriate. She said, you won't be doing that. And she stalked out. And she set all sorts of conditions for the surgery disallowing a proper uh, orthodox surgery that the college had taught me to do. So she was tying one hand behind my back. She wanted a bob each way, if you know what I mean. Um, Now, I I did that operation. It was extremely difficult. She was young, probably in her low 40s. And I shaved closer to the tumour than I liked. I was not really happy. I managed to get a join. She kept her muscle. She had good control. That aspect went well. 
But the pathologist who was the associate professor of pathology at Flinders was a bit concerned. He said, your clearance is not that good. I can't give you an absolute guarantee that it's clear. And I passed that on. But this is all she would accept. Um, but I was worried about her, so I checked her very carefully. And each, uh, each couple of months for a while, I'd bring her back and palpate the anastomosis, which was very low. And uh, at one stage, I thought I could feel just a tiny little thing. The same associate professor had a particular trick whereby he had a guide, a guide on his finger and he could slide a needle along that and aim it to within a millimetre or two of what he was pointing at. And he did all this and did cytology and he was a leading cytologist in this town and he rang me to say, I'm afraid there's recurrence there. I thought there had been. So, before I could ring her, the husband rang. And when I told him the answer, he said, you mustn't contact her. You mustn't ring her or write to her or tell her in any way whatsoever because that would destroy her faith. How about that? I later on found out that she had a faith healing ministry. And I was actually quite distressed by that. I'd been caught out. Um, and I thought, what sort of faith is it that can't stand the truth? Good question, I suspect. Uh, she didn't actually trust God uh, and ended up this recurrence became a significant thing. She wouldn't have any more treatment. Uh, she, she wouldn't see anybody else. Um, eventually it took her life. But you see, um, God had to fit in with her agenda. She had the way it had to be. And... Um, such people often die in great anger. They have great pain when their theology comes in conflict with the truth. Um, we need to understand something about medical science and every other science for that matter. It's a relatively crude instrument. It measures. It observes very carefully and then draws conclusions. It goes from a known area to an unknown area one step at a time with proper ethics, etc. And it's quite good at answering many of the how questions of how things occur, but it's not very good at going behind them um, and an answering the why questions. Science is too crude an instrument for that. That's the province, if you like, of philosophy, religion. So whence illness or dis-ease as the word actually is. Well, of course, science can't tell us that. It doesn't recognise something which we think about, talk about, the scriptures talk about, uh, the sin of human beings. The Bible says a lot about it. It says a lot about death. And, of course, we think there is a link between, um, between sin and disease and death. Uh, why do we think that? Well, because one day we believe in the fullness of the kingdom of God there won't be disease or death and nor will there be sin present. It will have been cleansed. Um, but there is a mystery. Um, there are some Christians who speak to me uh, about if you believe strongly enough you will not get any major illness. I've been a doctor for 45 years and a Christian believer for 53 but I've never seen the faintest evidence that that theory is true. In fact, if you widen the concept of illness to that of adversity uh, and any form of suffering for that matter it almost seems the reverse is actually the truth. It was guaranteed to the Christian believer. Jesus actually said, in this world you will have tribulation. So he promised it. Do you know what a tribulum is? That word comes from a Latin word, tribulum. Tribulum is a threshing instrument. It's a rod with a leather thong and then a bit of wood on the end. And it's for thumping the grain. So it was almost as if he, a loose translation might be, in this world you will be thumped. <clears throat> That's a very loose translation. But of course, he's just the end of the statement. He then says, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world.
And Paul actually says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, as he went around strengthening the churches in Asia. And yet Paul raised Eutychus after he fell out of the window, you remember, dead, brought him back to life. So you see, there is mystery here. Um, and Jesus didn't heal everybody. Did you know that? That man we spoke of had been born crippled. And so he was carried out and laid by the gate beautiful every morning. Jesus would have gone past him every time he went to the temple. Didn't heal him. Till the day when they asked, he asked alms of Peter and John. And they said, I haven't got any money, but such as we have we give you. Then Jesus healed the man. In other words, his agenda was God's timing. Uh, you might remember he, he once said to his brothers, my time has not yet come, your time's here all the time. He was talking about going up to that, uh, probably uh, the Feast of Tabernacles actually, but he took his timetable from his father's leading. Um, now there isn't any doubt that man's conscience seems to tell him that any serious disease is a punishment for something wrong he's done. Uh, you, you would all have perhaps thought like that at some stage. I remember when I was very young I thought a bit like that. I had this little philosophy I'd worked out. But um, you will also remember that Jesus didn't allow that sort of thinking. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And he said, no, you're on the wrong tack. Uh, and in Luke 13, um, when people told him about... Uh, certain Galileans, Jesus' own colleagues from his own town, his own uh, place, and Pilate had mixed their blood with the sacrifices. And Jesus said, do you think they were more sinful than the others? No. But I tell you, unless you, you, uh, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, there's a hard saying. Uh, and he rubbed it in, you see, he pursued it, and said, those 18 people on whom the Tower of Siloam fell were they worse offenders than all the others in the Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But, unless you repent. You see, so um, there is an indication there, isn't there? Um, of uh, the state of things. And I want to now make some general statements about suffering and healing. The first is that all true healing is of God. Um, and the second is, is like, like it, namely some high percentage, let's say 99.9% .9 of all healing is actually built in. It's a part of the creation. It's a part of the goodness of God's creation. A fellow called Ambrose Pare said, I dressed the wound, God healed the patient. That was about in the 1600s, I think. I, I can't actually remember when he said it, but he was a French dresser. Uh, very early in the field of looking after wounds. You see, no doctor heals a patient, certainly no surgeon does. We learn the laws of the body and we then observe them to make sure we, we work with them and remove the obstacles to healing. But we can't produce healing. And if the powers of healing are not there, the fate, the patient falls apart. Um, and we don't see um, the healing all that often. It just happens. Now, Bruce will know what inflammation is. Most people think inflammation is something bad that happens to you. Inflammation is the way by which everything heals. It's the essential mechanism, the process that God's built in. You cut your finger. I cut mine two days ago. Uh, it bleeds. Um, the blood vessels uh, lose blood, but quite quickly platelets start uh, conglutinating and they eventually block off the hole. At the same time, the vessel contracts. At the same time, if there's any bugs around, a chemical signal goes out <clears throat> and from the bone marrow, the white cells are summoned. Ordinary white killer cells, immune killer cells, macrophages, which are rubbish collectors. They just mop it all up, swallow it all up. Um, fibroblasts turn up 
and they start laying down fibrous tissue, filling up the gap and last of all, the skin cells grow across the top. It's all automatic and then by some signal, it just stops. That's normal. We don't take any notice. We don't see it. But it is remarkable, really. Um, it's just because it's normal, you see. We are, we are more intrigued by things which are unusual. Perhaps we are uh, short-sighted in that respect. Um, you see, the miraculous healings and the other signs Jesus did were always in the context of what he was always doing. They were always a sign of the kingdom, a sign of Messiah. they have been prophesied about Messiah. He was consciously fulfilling the work of Messiah. And anyway, it's consistent with, with what God is always doing, only just a bit faster. It was Lewis who pointed out that God is always turning water into wine. Look at it, the Barossa, the McLaren Vale, um, the vines are sucking up water, chlorophyll and sunlight making the energy, the grapes, the next thing, uh, it's almost automatic fermentation whereby the wine lasts instead of corrupting. He's doing it all the time on a massive scale across a huge canvas so we don't see it. And he's always multiplying grain and fish. Look in every field. Currently, we just come back from Port Lincoln yesterday, field after field, wheat, barley. And if you look in every river, as Lewis says, you see him multiplying the fish to feed the people. But we don't see that because it's normal. So we just have to open our eyes. And miraculous healings are always a sign of the coming kingdom. So they're a sign of the ultimate age. And we live in the penultimate age. A lot of things aren't perfect here. Um, we still all die. Lazarus died again. Lewis wrote a beautiful poem about Lazarus, how hard that would have been for him. Having arrived, I have to return and rerun it. Um, but you see, the main battle has been fought, as I know the people here know. Christ has triumphed over the kingdom of darkness. He's destroyed the power of death which was due to sin and, and the guilty conscience. He cancelled the sting of the death and cleansed the conscience. So, so the, the great battle is over, but the clean-up is going on. Another thing we should say, I think, is that the greatest miracle of healing is a total transformation of a rebel against God to a compliant believer. Paul called it transferring us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Um, and, of course, Jesus said, uh, unless you, you have the spirit of God blowing upon you, you can't even see the kingdom, let alone enter it. And of course Ezekiel turned about, talk, talked about the, the heart of flesh becoming uh, a, a heart of stone becoming a heart of flesh. It was the great miracle of the ages and it is more remarkable really that total transformation of human being than any of the healings that intrigue us so much. Um, so what if we widen the subject to to that of suffering in general. The Oxford Dictionary says the suffering is the experience of undergoing pain, loss, grief, defeat, wrong or punishment. Pretty wide, isn't it? And you know the world thinks of suffering as evil. Uh, they throw it in God's face all the time. When everything's going well, they don't thank him. When everything's going badly, they rail at him. Um, Think of the insurance industry. What is an act of God? It's always something bad, isn't it? Something else we should say is that physical pain is essential to life. You can't feel pain, you're not going to live long. That's just a fact. Uh, pain fibers save your life. There is a condition called congenital indifference to pain. Little children are born, they have pain fibres. The microscope shows they've got pain fibres, but they, the connections at the top end aren't, aren't right. So they don't notice it. 
So there's a little girl who got a great kick out of biting off the tip of her finger and writing with do a bit of red painting on the wall or on her books because mother would scream and carry on. Um, but these people die usually before they get to teenage or as young teenagers. They destroy themselves. So you need to understand that. But existential pain, well, that's worse than physical pain, I would suggest. Um, and it's about that that Lewis says, God whispers in our pleasures but shouts in our pains. He said, pain is a megaphone, God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Or elsewhere he talks about pain is the flag of truth planted in a rebel fortress. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Uh, but we won't carry that on any further. Uh, but rather make some, some, you might say, obvious statements about suffering. First is that the greatest suffering is not physical. Uh, and as a surgeon for over 30 years, I often see the relative suffering more than the patient, really. Often the person standing by who can't do anything is very distressed and sometimes the person in the middle of it, I've seen several people just recently where their families were quite distressed and they just soldiered on. You see, man's not just an animal. Um, the majority of suffering in the world is man-made. All right? Man against man. It was Lewis again who pointed out that whips and guns and bombs and prisons, prison camps are all made by men. Um, enormous amount of a man's suffering is through the loss of what he once had, historically. So the peace and the serenity and the security and the intimacy of Eden gave way to the fear, distrust and envy. And if you like Greek stories, a whole Pandora's box full of troubles that afflict the human person because of what we lost. Um, we could quote from, from the Old Testament to point out that loss of God's protection through disobedience to his instructions caused much suffering to the Jews and uh, also, of course, therefore, to, to many Christians. Let's read you a verse which you'll definitely know. Moses speaking. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do what's right in his eyes and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. So, of course, often they give up that protection by the disobedient. Um, and there are a number through the Old and New Testaments of diseases, uh, plagues, calamities of various sorts which are due to God puts it on them as um, a response to their disobedience. You remember Gehazi, Elisha's servant, when Naaman came to be cured um, and offered all these rich clothing to Elisha said, no, no, I don't need any of that. You, you don't owe me a thing. And away he went. But Gehazi couldn't miss the opportunity and he chased after Naaman and said, my master's changed his mind. I'll accept the six changes of clothing. Clothing was pretty expensive in those days. And you remember he came and stowed it in the tent. Elisha said, Gehazi, where have you been? Amazing, isn't it? God always potted uh, on people and the prophets always seem to know. On Miriam, she was struck with leprosy too through her complaining about Moses. And we needn't talk about Ananias and Sapphira. But you see, in these episodes, the scriptures make it quite clear why that particular judgment was being sent. And human beings are implacably opposed to suffering. You, politicians always vow to abolish it. Have you noticed that? Uh, just proving that they don't know what they're talking about. It's like abolishing, um, what is it, poverty? That was 20 years old, that promise. Um, we're about to enter into greater poverty, I've got a feeling. Um, 
And I've often heard relatives of a patient with cancer say, it's so unfair. I don't know whether you've heard that sort of talk. Well, Mrs M, who was sent to me with a varium meal, um, loss of weight and abdominal pain, and it was a classic when I put it up. Uh, it was a classic carcinoma of the stomach, quite a big one. And I said, I'm afraid there's not much doubt about that, but we'll have to prove it, its actual nature, and then discuss treatment. And she looked at me with a tragic face and she said, Why me? That's the classic question. You all heard that one. Actually, it's a very interesting question. She said, I've done good things. I have served people. I've, uh, I've always obeyed the, the laws. Um, she was always tragic. The poor lady, I could never talk to her. But you see, it's a very interesting question. It's a theological question. Because if, um, if we're all subject to the laws of chance, which we teach in our, uh, teach in our schools these days, <coughs> and that's resulted in evolution, if they were all operating, well then, why not be? You wouldn't ask the question, would you? But what the question says is, there's no random selection. It's deliberate. And I've chosen. There's a plan. There's someone with authority who has, uh, has assigned this pathology to me. That's what the question is saying. Or more than that, and I'm lodging a protest. I don't deserve it. She was saying all that in two words. Fascinating, really. Um, and the warning is, don't ever ask for your desserts. I remember uh, uh, a lovely Baptist minister who I know very well, who one day, one of his friends was saying on the phone, after all, I have my rights. And he said, Oh, it's right to you, what is it? Then go to hell. And there was a long silence on the phone at the other end who they weren't used to their Baptist minister talking like this, but was he right? You don't ask for rights. Don't ask for desserts. Um, the psalmist said, Lord, if thou should mark iniquity, who would stand? I think Shakespeare echoed that, didn't he, when he said... Um, Give every man his deserts, and who would escape whipping? It's the same thought. Got it from the scriptures, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to tell a story, or probably a couple. But about 20 years ago, I visited my brother's church in Brisbane. It was a big church. <coughs> um, and on the Sunday evening, they had an inter international guest speaker, and she was wheeled in in her wheelchair. I'd heard of her. Johnny Erickson. She'd be an excellent athlete, horse rider, show jumper, and she broke her neck at the age of 17 from a diving accident. A C4 on 5, that's the fourth on fifth cervical vertebra, fracture dislocation, transected the spine, and that made her a quadriplegic. And from then on, she couldn't move anything below the top of her shoulders. She couldn't feel anything below that either. One space higher, she probably wouldn't have survived. One space lower, she would have had some movement in her hands. So she had the maximum loss of function that a survivor can get. And um, she got all the usual problems of a severe quadriplegic. She wasted. She spent months on a striker frame being turned every two hours. She had terrible bed sores. They needed surgery. She had surgery to her bed sores without any anaesthesia. That was standard in those days. Uh, I was working, at about that time I was working in uh, Hampstead Hospital in the spinal unit Mark II. I was looking after the paraplegics and the quadriplegics. And I used to get involved in their surgery. You need to sit up there and read a book, uh, go to sleep this time. And the patient stayed awake, they weren't even sedated. They were just, the surgeon would get cracking and he'd saw bits of bone off and he would swing flaps. And the patient occasionally would hear the spurt of blood before a clip was applied, it wouldn't have been all that much fun because they didn't even have station then. She went through all that. She was permanently catheterised. Of course, she couldn't feed herself. She couldn't even blow her own nose or wipe away her own tears. She was the classical 
talking head. But she was a remarkable woman. And that day when she spoke in that church, she was mature. She had thought through everything. She, there wasn't a, 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 the tiniest, tiniest little bit of self-pity there at all. Um, and she went uh, through anger, frustration, and she writes it all in her book, Deep Depression and Lots of Questions. But she had some good Christian friends and a supportive family and she thrashed through all the problems with them. Uh, she had a few inmate friends who were atheists and they were cynical and judgmental about it and she, she rejected their explanations as quite inadequate. Um, she trusted God, she prayed to him, she submitted herself to his answers, his processing and his refining in her life and some of it was actually very difficult for her. And She went through depression as was often the way. She became a very skillful painter. She even ran her own um, shows of her paintings. It was quite remarkable. And she used to sing. She put out her own uh, albums. How do you sing with no intercostal muscles and only half a phrenic nerve? Well, I don't know, but she sang very powerfully because she sang things which were very real, like when other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And who is more helpless than a C four on five quad? Um, but I was uh, amazed at when I heard her, and she's now the author of 30 books, at least 30 books. I'd like to share a couple of things she says about Affliction. She calls it adversity, which is a good general word. She wrote a book about it. She said, suffering can shape you for good or for ill. Under God's hand, if we accept it as such, it is for good. And she said, if you're not experiencing adversity at this moment, then let me be a prophet to you. It will come. <laughs> well, Jesus said that anyway. It's as much a part of life on this planet as sunrise or sunset or wind in the trees, she says. She quotes James, James 1, 2. Whenever trials come upon you, let it be an opportunity for joy. Now, we always do that, don't we? Um, she says it. She said, when your faith's tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, and that leads to patience and maturity and character. And God knows that real character is more important than temporary comfort. Uh, she reminds us quadriplegia is temporary. So she had a long focal length. Um, we learn a lot from reading what she's written. She said, no one likes these interruptions or discipline. They spoil our plans for a comfortable life. We demand miracles of healing and are willing to believe all sorts of wild irrationalities in order to get what she wants. She'd been through that, you see. And she said, God will show us the difference between his will and wishful thinking if we want to know enough, but it'll probably take a long time. Now, she was speaking out of bitter experience. She also says suffering is a gift, and she took a little while to see this. Um, she quotes Paul to the Philippians, you're given in this battle the privilege of not merely believing in Christ, but also suffering for his sake. Uh, and she, she claims that Many things that used to distract her, sport, horse riding, even romance, were removed from her life and she could concentrate and work through the big issues of her faith. Now how about that from a young woman? It's astonishing really. So, um, you know, you wouldn't believe I just said that, but she's a quadriplegic and from one point of view she's earned the right to say that. And she says, finally, nothing but nothing draws the attention of unbelievers like the way we endure hardship. I want to close by telling you about Jill. Jill was 42, an intelligent, fit TAFE lecturer, daughter of a prominent Adelaide uh, radiologist actually. He came in with her and I knew him straight away and he introduced his daughter. She was married to a big business tycoon. She was a mother of three 
She lived in a big house with an acre of garden and some would say her life was complete. She was sent to me by a gastroenterologist following a colonoscopy for bleeding and that's a standard examination now. He found eight tumours, five were benign and three were malignant. She had no family history, it was a sporadic disease. Her liver functions and CT were normal so I advised her there's really only one operation she could have total removal of the colon. It was turning into cancer. Uh, for some reason it was very unstable. She had to lose all of the mucosa. So that means total colectomy and an abdominoperineal resection which takes out the rectum and the, the anal canal, seals it off and gives her an ileostomy. And 18 months later, her liver functions went up and a CT scan showed multiple metastases in the liver, we had been too late. At this stage, her husband left. He was a busy man. He didn't have time for a sick wife. I gave her chemotherapy uh, because I used to do that in those days and I saw quite a lot of her. We got to know each other well. Um, but there was no effective suppression of her metastases, as we call them, in the liver from the chemotherapy. She became a Christian. How? I said, she couldn't tell me. Isn't that interesting? See, in the university, in the IBF, we learned the formula of how to bring someone to Christ. You know, God doesn't take any notice of formulae. I didn't become a Christian according to any formula. Uh, she didn't know how she became a Christian. C.S. Lewis doesn't know how he became a Christian and he is one of the best explainers of spiritual things that's ever lived, or at least one of those who was most prolific in writing about it. Now she couldn't explain it, but actually I've seen this many times. Someone has said, when you're facing your death, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. <laughs> in other words, the games stop if someone's honest. Some people keep playing games. We had fantastic discussions. Um, we swapped books. She was an avid reader. She grew so fast in understanding the things of God. Um, consults were a time of great blessing. I stopped charging her for consults because she was a blessing to me and as like as not, I then ended up praying for her and I, I don't think Medicare covers prayer, I'm not sure. But she became jaundiced one stage. I remember her coming in one day and she gave me a jaundiced smile. Jaundiced doesn't look comfortable but you can't feel it of course. And I asked her how she was and she said, wonderful, every day is a great adventure. There's a paradox there, isn't there? Um, many people wouldn't understand that. Eventually she was admitted to a hospice where I used to keep seeing her and sharing the things of the faith and praying with her, occasionally reading to her and she died there. And her family, when they brought my books back, and came to see me, they said they'd never seen her so happy and so peaceful in her whole life. And the question arose in my mind, which has often arisen, and I must pass it on to you. Do you think she would have come into such an experience, joy and peace in Christ, if she had not developed cancer of the bowel with secondaries? You don't have to answer the question. No one knows. You see, one day I think um, we're going to have to reclassify some of the things we call disasters and tragedies in this world, the unfairness that people talk about. And when we look back with the retrospectoscope, which is just a wonderful instrument, and we'll probably all have one in heaven, um, because it's accurate, you see. It's actually accurate, whereas looking ahead, we often say stupid things. Now, just across the road from here is one of my patients whose wife died a couple of years after I had done an operation. She came along very late. She said, my hemorrhoids are getting worse and worse. I said, what? She said, they're bleeding and they're so painful. I thought, well, one thing it won't be is hemorrhoids. But someone had told her that two years before she had an advanced cancer well, she had secondaries in the liver and we took them out on this occasion and did the operation. 
she was a uh, a loyal, faithful, devout Catholic lady and her husband, and they prayed about everything. I don't think I've ever seen more faithful prayers and people less afraid of death than both of them. He's now had a stroke. When I heard he'd had a stroke, I hastened to see him because um, I, th- I thought this man, who has a lovely sense of humour, of wouldn't it be terrible if he can't speak? No, the stroke was on his left side, so it affected the right side of the brain. So his speech centre was spared and he still had his cheeky sense of humour. And I said, Tom, you've always been a great prayer. You can keep doing that. Uh, and I read, of course, uh, something which is appropriate probably to finish with, which Paul said to the Corinthian Christians, Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison because we look not at the things that are seen but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. And I can always pray with Tom and we agree and He is continuing to pray a faithful prayer. He used to pray for me every day when I was operating and I was so grateful for someone like him. So you see, another tragedy which we might see in a different light. Um, God knows what he is doing. All we've done is dance across the top of the subject of suffering. But you see, a third of the New Testament is about the subject. We can't get away from it. And I am quite sure that um, Johnny is a prophet to us. If you haven't experienced that, it'll happen. Jesus promised it too. Uh, But he says, in me you'll have peace. You'll also have tribulation uh, in this world. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And in due course, the fullness of the kingdom will come. And then we'll know that a lot of the disasters and tragedies, as we call them, were necessary. Till then, we don't see completely and we need to hold our judgments and trust God. Now, that's all I need to say. Our time's up. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can. I don't know what you do uh, usually here, but you're welcome to if you want to. Um, and Wes will know if there's other things that need to be said. Um, I just really appreciate what you've shared tonight and resonate with what you said. But I'd be really interested in your reflections on uh, when a mother in Biafra in Sudan who's holding a child, uh, just the larger scale of suffering that the individual feels that in our rich Western society, God will bring our poverty and suffering to bring us to him. But just interested in your reflections on in the light of what you said, for the for the individuals in hmm. in those places where a woman might have seen her family raped and killed and holding the only child she's got left, just that kind of situation which is far too prevalent in our world today. It is too prevalent and uh, again it's virtually always human beings doing that because it's often been pointed out to us there's enough food in this earth to easily feed all the people but it's controlled by the market, by, you know, prices have to be at a certain level. Um, The drugs for AIDS are too expensive, so, um, you know, they're only just becoming available to a huge number of people. No, the distribution is human controlled. Um, We all get that helpless feeling as we see uh, what happens in Africa. But, of course, one of the main problems... Uh, causing these, this distress in Africa is, is little tyrants. It's politics. It's the way humans run their affairs. It's power of one person over another. And so I think Christians 
have to work at that level. I think we are careful about giving money unless we know someone on the ground and there are many networks that you can trust where they can name the people on the ground and you can know that if they're truly Christian that they will go about dealing with the problem the best way we can. But yes, that is the argument that many people will use against God. Um, but as I've pointed out, the majority of suffering in the earth is human caused and our aim needs to be um, against those political powers which do that. Um, we need to complain to our governments that what they're giving is too small for a rich country, because it is. Um, now, it is, it is distressing. Um, but uh, I think we need, to, uh, we need to go for those answers, which uh, we are a wealthy country. Uh, America is a very wealthy country, but it's very generous and a huge amount of uh, upholding of the poor of the world has been done from that country, more than most people in Australia would know about. Um, there are many, many programs. Our own church is involved in a program which goes to Africa and teaches um, the people who have been displaced out into the, the deserts, again, by human power, um, and they edu- help educate them, and while they're there, feed them. But... Um, Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. I don't know what he meant by that. But I think we know when the Spirit is leading us to, to address some of the terrible things we see and we also need his leadership as to how to because there's no simple answer. But it is one of the things which re- people rail against God about. The answer seems to be usually political. Now I have no good answer for that. Father, we thank you for what we've been privileged to share in tonight. We thank you for the way you work and move and for what we've learned from what you've done in and around Neil's life. And Father, we thank you for this dear man and we pray your blessing upon him. And Father, we thank you that as he's spoken tonight, we really believe you have spoken to us. And you've helped us to see things just a little more clearly about the events in our own lives, about the things that are happening around us. Father, we pray that you will just continue to speak to us, uh, continue to raise up people like Neil who can share out of life's wonderful, sometimes difficult experiences. And Father, we just thank you that it's all part of your love for us as a father who delights in his children. Father, we thank you for our time tonight and we do commit ourselves to you as you have committed yourself to us as we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Vanessa is going to have the official release and launch of the CD, songs in which we've been hearing tonight. So on the Saturday the 22nd, about 7, 7, 7.30, come along here and have a great night.